President Joe Biden takes oath of office and we review the U.S.-Nigeria relations. Governor Yesu Mwike pledges 500 million naira to help rebuild Sakoto market. Whose money is it? Well, this is Plus Politics and I am Mary Anakon. Joe Biden has been sworn in as the 46th president of the United States while declaring that democracy has prevailed. Biden took the oath of office at the U.S. Capitol, which had been battered by an insurrection a few weeks earlier. After taking his place in the White House Oval Office, he began to undo several executive actions of his predecessor, especially on matters ranging from the deadly coronavirus to climate change. But that a new leader with new ideologies has taken over the nation, also known as the leader of the free world. What will the fate of its relations with Africa and most especially Nigeria be? Well, joining us to have this conversation is Liboros Oshoma. He is a legal practitioner and of course he is an international affairs analyst. Thank you very much Liboros for joining us. My pleasure. And of course we're being joined uh, on the phone um, by Agogo Obo. He is a foreign affairs analyst. Thank you very much, Agogo, for joining us. Thank you very much. And uh, Agogo, begins. <laughs> begins. OK, I, I'm going to start with you. I'm uh, going to start. All right, I'll start with you, Liboris. Um, you and I have talked about US-Nigeria relations over and over in several um, platforms. But let's start by taking a look at Trump's um, last days in office, right after, uh, you know, the capital uh, invasion. Uh, and also leading up to the fact that he decided not to show up at the inauguration. He, I mean, for 150 years, there's not been any president of the United States that had not shown up for an inauguration but him. Let's look at, let's just take a walk through uh, all that's happened leading up to Biden's inauguration. Let's start from there. Yeah, uh, it, it's um, the first question you would ask is that um, does Trump actually believe in democracy? Um, Trump is not, you know, a democratic person. Um, if you look at um, his antecedent, speaks volume. You know, he believes so much in himself. He believes um, um, that he should just be allowed to continue. And you know, he had said it even at different fora that he should just continue and continue and continue until he's tired. And so he did also really believe that, um, you know, he didn't win the election. And um, typical of his um, uh, behavior, you know, Trump appointed um, more judges, you know, federal judges in four years than Obama appointed in eight years. And um, if you also remember, just you know, um, around the election, Trump had about 60 cases in court mm -hmm. uh, because he had thought that you know, most of these judges were going to rule in his favor. And um, so that's not the, the spirit of a Democrat. And then lastly, um, um, uh, is the fact that Americans had always been known to be a racist country. But because of the structures, the rule, the application of the rule, um, it seems to promote freedom and free culture. Mm. But when you now had a president that promotes racism, that speaks and breeds racism, that embodying, you know, the ordinary white supremacist, you know, to come out, like we say in Africa, when you send your father, when a father sends his son mm. to go and steal, he pulls the door. So that embodying a lot of them, including some of them who are in the Republican, who, that's why you still heard some of them strongly believing that Trump actually won the election, that he was cheated, even though they knew so well that um, the election didn't go in their but favor. Did they really know? Um, they know, they know. Again, I, I'm, 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 I'm willing to ask this question because, you know, there are people who are saying that, oh, Trump probably would never have a legacy to all erased. But what is Trump's legacy after now as 45? <laughs> Yeah, um, you, you, can't, you can't say Trump would have um, a legacy because there are still a lot of people that believed that 
Trump did so much for America than anybody could have done. But be that as it may, we also agree that, um, yes, Obama had um, a rough time trying to roll back the economy. And so some of the programs they put in place, uh, Trump benefited from you know, those programs. And that's why you saw the increase in job in jobs creation during his um, first two years in office. So it was as if, you know, he came with a magic wand. You know, so you, those you can't rule away, there is legacy. You can't take them away from him. And then also, no matter how much you, you hate him, um, he actually, you know, tried to, um, his foreign policies, unlike um, before his time, you had situations where foreign policies, America would be more diplomatic mm -hmm. in handling foreign policies. Uh, Trump wasn't diplomatic at all, and he says it as it is, especially as regards China. Even though he had businesses in China, Trump, if you give Trump an opportunity, he's somebody that ordinarily would want to see China exterminated. <laughs> and so all of these are, are legacies that you can't take away from him. So, mm. so go, positive or negative? Go, go. My next question is for you. Um, there are people who think that Ch Trump was a necessary evil. He was a game changer. He was a disruptor. And they would never really say that he wasn't such a great president. There are people who will swear by Trump. You could see um, from the number of people who showed up in Florida to welcome him and his wife, uh, Ivanka, um, when they left the White House. What's your take on the Trump presidency? Well, I, I think it would be a travesty to... Imagine that uh, we can talk about all, everything about Donald Trump um, and imagine we could get in a nutshell to say that uh, this is who Donald Trump is. I mean, it's um, like a mission impossible. But uh, a lot of people still pass for Donald Trump um, as a reality president. And then they got what they asked for for four years. And um, that meant that is when you look at the, the, the sort of people who invaded Capitol Hill, uh, two weeks ago, you had uh, anarchists, you had uh, racists, fascists, all manner of people you never would imagine to be associated with the establishment in Washington. DC. But that's what Trump eventually, interestingly, what his legacy will look like. Um, if you ask who was Trump's state, I mean, who is impacted most, it goes back to all of those guys you probably would never have imagined um, an American president who want to associate with it. even though he did come out later on to condemn what happened there, but he was the one who was raising them on all the proud boys and the rest of them. Mm. That's one thing I think in terms of the legacy. And then uh, by the side, you know, when he uh, gave his speech and then he was getting it into the um, Air Force One to leave the White House for the last time, you know the, you know the song they played for him, oh. Frank Sinatra's I Did It My Way. <laughs> they were petty. So, Exactly. So Donald Trump did everything his way, and um, and I guess you know that's what exactly who he was at the end of the day. He left office with one of the lowest ratings, like the lowest in the century, of American president. So um, I, I, I'm not too sure what to make of, of the crowd that we have seen there, but the 71 million people who voted for him, the people who will wager that more than three quarter of them, you know, after the whole. After the results were announced, and then the results were released, lost election, lost it. Okay, L let's talk about Biden. He was sworn in yesterday. Amazing speech. Um, he rolled out a lot of things, but I want to start by um, looking at the content of his speech. Um, I, there are a couple of things that we're going to put on the screen, but what really struck me uh, in his speech, and I think I tweeted it, was that he said. Um, we're not here to make enemies, but we would we'd rather be, you know, be friends and neighbors. But let's take a look at that speech. It was mostly very American. But what did you take away from it quickly, Liboris? Yeah, um, what's the question you should ask or you ask yourself is what made Mandela, Nelson Mandela great? Not because he went to prison. Partly he went to prison, yes. But people expected that when he came, that um, it was an opportunity for the blacks in South Africa to take their pound of flesh from the white minority. Mm. But um, Mandela came and said, no, this is the time for us to be neighbors. This is the time for us to rebuild. This is the time for us to come together and make South Africa great. That's what's made Mandela great. People expected that, look, this man would come and take a pound of flesh. It's the same way um, America had never been divided the way they are now 
America, you can only think of America like this, say about you know, 50, 60 years backward. And so Trump, the destruction that Trump has orchestrated, the bitterness, the, the dead devil attitude of some persons who ordinarily wouldn't, you wouldn't associate, like I, I said, with the establishment, mm -hmm. you know, are things you cannot just come and, um, and erase or, you know, um, you should be careful to ensure that you are able to win back that confidence that America was enjoying. And so that's why um, I think Biden is starting on that footing. And also, um, if you remember, when he won uh, um, the Senate, the, the first time he won in 1973, mm -hmm. his um, senatorial district, he was voted for, he became a senator by virtue of the fact that he had more black minority in his senatorial yes, district. Yes. And so, with all of this, uh, and, and somebody who has consistently fought the cause of the minority, and then also having a female vice president who is also from the minority stock, against, you know, what you would what call the Trump's, the, the Trump's legacy. Mm. I do not expect him to be otherwise. And, and so, uh, then, but quickly, permit me, I see a lot of, because your, your topic says what's in is for mm. Nigeria. The problem facing Biden now is much more than what Nigerians should be waiting to want to benefit we from. We will come if, to that. If if there are fallouts, fantastic, like one of the fallouts, which is one of the executive orders that he has signed. Yeah. These are fallouts. But to expect that yes, African would have um, a definite spot, you know, as distinct from just normal foreign pol policies mm. that would, you know, um, maybe uh, extend to Africa in terms of foreign policy relationship. Africans should just be that farewell because they also got their finger burnt with uh, the high expectations from Obama. From Ob I was about, uh, I was about to say that. It's definitely going to be the same thing with yeah, this. Yeah, so quick, since you've taken us there, Agogo, um, there were so many expectations from a black president, which was Obama, from Africa. And I mean, I still hear, I still see on Twitter people having that conversation that, oh, Biden is going to favor Africa. But we have seen in the past one year, um, the push and shove that has happened between the U.S. and, Amer and Nigeria, um, it, it might not be a face-off of sorts, but we saw what happened um, for Ngozi Okonjewala with the World Trade Organization. We also saw what happened to uh, Adeshina with the AFDB. Um, America keeps insisting that they have a great relationship with Nigeria, but we also see an undertone of uh, you know, more like a drag when it comes to Nigeria having to, you know, take a seat or, you know, lead something uh, on the international stage. Why do you think that is? Something the Boros also said, um, we not likely will see any significant shift uh, in the U.S. foreign policy. Let, let's run back um, to uh, George uh, W. Bush, uh, where AGOA, which is the uh, standout economic policy, or relation, uh, color piece of uh, U.S. diplomacy with Africa, uh, Africa Growth of Opportunity Act. This was uh, a Republican president. The uh, Bill Clinton came in afterwards, and they continued from where uh, Bush had stopped. Um, you had uh, Obama coming and inherit um, from Bill Clinton the Binational Commission, which is supposed to be um, uh, a co co cooperation between Nigeria and the United States. It's sort of the highest collaboration between Nigeria and the United States. So. If you would look at even uh, Donald Trump, at what, ha what what has happened between Trump and uh, a lot of stuff has been happening. They've been working on the Sahel, they've been throwing in a lot of money, even with the COVID-19, uh, towards Nigerian authorities and uh, a lot of other uh, uh, neighboring African countries. Um, the security pact partnership is still going on. We've got a lot of stuff happening. The U.S. African Command is still going on. Uh, but the only problem was that Donald Trump did not own many of these policies. You know, he was more interested in, in his own um, agenda. So, uh, one of the expectations for Biden, he's got a lot of guys who come on board who are very familiar uh, with us. I mean, Secretary of State designate Anthony Blinken was with Barack Obama. He's very familiar with Nigeria also to the Sahel. Um, you have uh, Lynn uh, Green, who is going to go to the United Nations. She's worked also in Nigeria too for many years and many of the African countries. Many of the issues faced in Nigeria won't be strange to them, uh, like Trump, when many of the guys who came in, uh, Stilson, who was Secretary of State, he, he didn't spend one week, he came for, he came for a tour mm. in Africa. It was right in the plane that he was fired. He didn't even get a opportunity to defeat Donald Trump. Mm. 
So we probably won't have that, those sort of um, uh, drama happen. Mm. Uh, think about it, just one of those decisions made uh, a couple of hours ago, right? Mm -hmm. Nigeria has been taking up the travel ban together with a number of uh, Muslim uh, countries that Trump yes. has slammed the ban in February. Mm -hmm. So maybe that's the pointer that <laughs> is probably in good hands this time. But I would like to keep my fingers crossed in terms of any significant thing happening uh, across different areas of Nigeria and United States corporate. We will see a seismic shift in the U.S. foreign policy. Liberus is shaking his head. More like he doesn't, he doesn't necessarily agree with you. Liberus, why are you shaking your head? Yeah, I do not agree that, uh, because first and foremost, let's look at it. You don't just expect, um, American is not um, a, a Santa Claus that is so well to do that they are looking but for. But does it not present itself as, as no, one? No, they do not. Because they America not. seems to be very interested in no, other what countries. They are only interested. They may not say they're Santa Claus, no. but do they present themselves? No, they as never one? present themselves as Santa Claus. But people tend to see them as Santa Claus because you think American is coming to give you to dish out largesse, but they are coming for interests. They always come. They anytime you see them interested in a country or in a region, they have something that is of beneficial to them. And so, but because of our naivety. We leave our flanks open and take America as a Father Christmas, a Santa Claus that is coming to distribute largesse. And so the question is, what, how well have we positioned ourselves to benefit from any foreign policy fallout that might come from this administration? The answer is no, we have not, nothing at all. What is our foreign policy in terms of integration, even in Africa, not to talk of, you know, um, yeah. collaboration with, you know, the West. There is nothing on ground at all. Um, here, look at the COVID, for example. We just sit down, we have folded our hands, we're waiting for vaccine. Until recently, we said we, be, we budgeted about how many billion to look for, uh, you know, an internally grown vaccine. So with all of this, Americans cannot just take out time and begin to go around Africa and look for, you know, who to help. They would, first and foremost, look for where their interest lies. Even like I told you, the problem that Joe Biden had inherited is the problem of division, segregation, and then the coronavirus that had hit them so badly. So because he wants to rebuild the bridges, he would want integration. He will want to heal wounds, which he has said. And that's why one of the fallouts is, look, these people that you wrongly have banned because of their religion. Mm. Let's, you know, everybody come on board and then we take our time to begin to relook at them. Mm. Because Trump, to a very large extent, you could say was biased and acted on impulse. Mm -hmm. So one of those executive orders have benefited us. It does not mean that they just sat down and say, Nigeria is, you know, this and so we should unban. No, because you want, you know, an, an all-inclusiveness. And that's I mean, on Nigeria one side. Was, wasn't the only country on that list. We that's had a and the rest So of them. because of that, some people are saying, no, in my favor. For Trump, for example, what was Trump's, what were his policies that benefited us? Apart from once in a while talking about, you know, stop killing Christians in Nigeria yeah. and the rest, nothing. And when we go for this bilateral talks with agencies there, including when our president visits, what is our shopping list? Mm -hmm. Nothing. What's our shopping list? You can see, even jokingly, you see some of the photographs, everybody that is on the side of the American president is prepared with papers and pen, but us, we're ready to come eat. So that's why we, are, we have not positioned ourselves strategically in terms of, you know, West Africa, not to talk of Africa, to say, okay, yes, when the issues of West Africa are discussed, is discussed, would be at the forefront, would be a force to be reckoned with, to be discussed mm -hmm. with. So in terms of, that's where I'm looking at it from, you know, okay. narrowly and broadly. So in other words, we're not ready and nothing's going to change if we're not we are, ready. We are not ready. Agogo, this is my last question. Um, the former Vice President Atiku Abubakar had a shopping list. Let me borrow from um, Liboris. He had a shopping list of sorts. When he was wishing, um, congratulating um, President Joe Biden, he did ask for three things. He made three demands. Um, he did ask that um, Nigeria be taken off the, the travel ban. Well, thank goodness that has been done. He also um, talked about strengthening U.S.-Nigeria ties, and he also talked about America helping us with the fight against terrorism. Do you see that as a top priority on uh, Joe Biden's list right now or anytime soon? So, uh, 
So they, they've done the easy one, which was uh, take out uh, Nigeria from the travel ban, even though many of those, um, uh, what you what you said, objections by General Trump were actually genuine uh, concerns about Nigeria's, um, uh, uh, the incongruity of Nigeria's data. Maybe that has helped us to try the other things, is, um, the national identification of the set of our and balance in the whole process has been carried out. It's a legitimate argument about what um, the Nigerian data base actually looks like. Okay. But with um, strengthening Nigerian ties, the United States ties, I think it's big. big. Uh, the Binational Commission, which exists already, looks at things like um, a democracy, um, it looks at the Niger Delta, it looks at food security, and many of those other things which are working. And then with what is going on with um, the problem, especially in the Northeast and the Sahel, in terms of security, the United States over the years, even from the Obama time, you see they shy away from putting boots on the gr on ground. What happened in Benghazi with um, uh, the U.S. and uh, you know the, the aftermath of Gaddafi, mm -hmm. they're still very very scared of having troops on the ground. You can look at Syria even also too. It was such a big um, problem then. I mean, uh, Obama then kept talking about uh, if the red line is crossed, if the red line is crossed, and he kept adjusting the red line even though there was not evidence for just a, a chemical weapon. So, will they bring in troops to help uh, the war mercenaries, like people have talked about, uh, sincerely doubt it. What they talk about more often than not in um, a number of conferences that happened is try to see how um, the countries that have been affected by terrorism can work together. Talk more about soft power these days. How they can empower the people mm. to, have to be employed, how they can get people educated in them. You know, many of those factors that are important for the skin poverty and the problems being faced in the North are being tackled rather than um, uh, going the way of arming people to go and fight the terrorist head off, which mm. is what, unfortunately, the Nigerian authorities oftentimes have thought is the best way out of the problem to, to, um, to, to use the, the gun shoot to choose okay. the republic, which has never happened. Poverty can never be driven away by guns and bombs and all of that. We have, we have to go back to the basics, which is uh, why are the people poor? Because they don't have jobs, because they're not going to school, because their debt is not being controlled. And all of those things which we know as a indices by on the development of rights in places like uh, the Northeast and the Sahel. Very true. Well, thank you very much. Uh, uh, Agogo Obo is uh, a foreign affairs analyst and, of course, Liboros Oshoma is an international affairs analyst. Thank you, gentlemen. Of course, uh, you had said at the beginning, yeah. Liboros, that Nigeria, America will not come and fight. Yeah, but uh, permit me to Nigeria's quickly on the, on them. Um, if you permit me. Well, out of time, one minute. Please, yes, on um, um, Atiku Abubakar's uh, shopping list. I think um, Atiku is trying to be very pedestrian and political with um, that shopping But list. he's a politician. Yeah, very, very, because you have a government that is, you know, that is inept and so you want to take shine with little things. Um, I, because I had expected, like um, Magogo said, for him to be specific in what areas. You're talking about America coming to help you with the fight against uh, Boko Haram. Even America hire mercenaries to do some of this. So why don't you do the same thing? You know, well, maybe it just goes so, to say, then, it goes again to say, it is not, what you said, are, we see America as Santa Claus. So yeah, we, because we, at we the end of the day, list. the question is when it came with the chip, kidnap of Chibok guests, what happened? Why did they go back? Well, that's nobody's enough. answering those that's questions. That's a whole kettle of fish that we have to deal with another day. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for being part of this conversation. We'll take a short break. And when we come back, we'll go to River State because Governor Yesomwike has pledged a whooping sum of 500 million naira to Sakuta fire victims. We'll be right back after this break.